Hello, and welcome to this session on mitigating financial disparity. I'm Courtney Fingar, Editor-in-Chief of Investment Monitor, and I will be leading this session. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing from our two very knowledgeable and distinguished panelists. Now, this is a topic when we're thinking about poverty, about the wealth gap, about financial disparity that is, is extremely pressing and urgent right now. The wealth gap has been widening over the past few decades with many implications for, for politics, for the global economy, for business, and of course, most importantly, for people's lives. But this has only been accentuated. The problem has only grown as a result, as a result of the global pandemic. So although it's a little bit of a, a depressing or, or at least discouraging topic, and we're going to talk a bit about some solutions where they might can be found and what can be done. Just to put in a bit of context, um, most of you watching, if you're engaged on, on these kinds of topics, will know that the UN Sustainable Development Goals had some quite ambitious targets. Chief among them was to eradicate poverty by 2030. That was always a bit of a, of a lofty goal, perhaps overly aspirational and a little bit beyond reach. And the targets are, are nowhere near being met. We're quite far off track and the pandemic has, has thrown us potentially even further behind. So we wanna talk a bit about how can we get closer to those targets? Um, where and what are the traps that slow down the reduction of poverty? And in what ways can businesses help? Also, what can governments do? What are the role of financial institutions in all of this? It's a lot to tackle, but we have two people very well placed to help us do that. Let me introduce you to Mahesh Kotecha, with apologies for my bad pronunciation of, of your names. He is president of Structured Credit International Corporation based in the U.S., and he has a huge amount of experience dealing with issues of debt. Now, his firm advises emerging market financial institutions on access to capital, and they have several clients in emerging countries, in particular in Africa, and they also work with governments. We also have Olga Visakova, a banker working for a Russian regional bank called Bank Center Invest, which has EBRD and DEG, the two development banks, as the largest shareholders and which operates on an ESG model, which of course is going to be very important for our discussion. So before we get into some potential remedies, let's first talk a little bit about the scale of the challenge with relation to combating global poverty and reducing the wealth divide. Mahesh, I know that the increase in poverty brought on by COVID-19 is a big concern of yours. It's something you're studying very closely. How dire is the emergency and what can we do? Thank you, Courtney. Uh, I, uh, I uh, uh, think that's an excellent place to start. Uh, the UN, as you know, put uh, the uh, uh, poverty elimination as uh, effectively the first MDG goal. The World Bank estimates that in 2020, the impact of COVID-19 drove about 119 to 124 million people into poverty. Uh, in tw it, that is the first time since 1990 that poverty had actually increased. Um, in 2021, the number is set to grow further to between 143 and 163 million, the vast, vast majority being in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, some estimates for the medium term go as high as over half a billion uh, or more if GDP growth uh, loss is of about 10%. Uh, the World Bank data shows that uh, uh, that if you reduce debt, you can actually enhance poverty reduction expenses. I can talk more about that uh, when you like. Well, and it, it's not really easy to prescribe any solution, but I know that you've been advocating for various ways that we could deal with this debt burden issue. What do you recommend? Well, uh, first of all, uh, the World Bank data shows that in the last round of heavy indebtedness uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, the, there was an initiative called the HIPIC Heavily Indebted Poor Country Initiative, which launched in 1996. There was a, a follow-on a few years, a decade later, called Multilateral Debt Relief Initiative, MDRI. Uh, 
and they together provided 125 billion in debt relief to nearly 40 countries. Sudan is about to qualify under that HIPIC program as well, and with Eritrea the only remaining eligible country. So it's a it's a long rollout. It is very clear from the data uh, that lower debt service uh, from these two programs allowed these countries to divert spending from debt service into poverty alleviating expenditures. So there is a direct relationship between debt reduction and poverty reduction, a debt relief provision and poverty reduction. So so private sector and the public sector can help today by participating in debt relief that is more effective than what the G20 initiative called the Debt Service Suspension Initiative launched last year uh, is doing, or even the comprehensive, more comprehensive debt uh, service relief framework that called the Common Framework that was established late last year can do. There is very little take up of those two uh, programs uh, which have their deficiencies and I have a solution that would be better than them. I can talk about the deficiencies and the solutions if you like. And what would a solution look like? Well, in, uh, the first, in, first, in, first, 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 the deficiencies. Uh, let us consider Africa, Courtney. Over the last decade, two dozen African countries for the first time raised $100 billion in euro bonds pre-pandemic. Um, but last October, 20, in October 2020, Zambia defaulted on its bonds, euro bonds. S&P and Fitch cut Zambia's bond ratings to default uh, and Moody's to CA near default, shutting down the country's access to euro bond markets. Zambia was not alone. Others defaulting in 2020 included Ecuador, Lebanon, Suriname, and Argentina. Nearly a dozen other countries could follow uh, as they are in high debt distress today, um, such as Cameroon, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, Laos, Repub uh, Rep Republic of the Congo, and Mozambique, among others, Chad also. A year ago, G20 launched the DSSI initiative that I mentioned, Debt Service Suspension Initiative. It offered suspension, not forgiveness, of debt for up to $12, $12 billion for 46 countries. That's not very much money. And only half of that was less than half of it was taken. $5 billion was taken up last year. Three countries are now considering debt relief under the broader program that the G20 put together last November in response to criticisms of the G DSSI on called the Common Framework, the new one is called Common Framework, and only three countries have applied for relief under that, uh, Zambia, Chile, and Ethiopia. There are reasons why others don't want to do it. Uh, the, uh, uh, the key reason is that this Common Framework forces the countries to default on private sector debt and essentially shuts off their access to the capital markets. So though progress is being made, uh, by the IMF in negotiating macroeconomic framework with Chad and Zambia to the, uh, with, with Chad and Zambia, um, the progress on the restructuring is not likely to happen until like, next year at the earliest. So in the meantime, what we have is a slow moving train wreck. We have, uh, countries with liquidity problems that are increasingly facing insolvency due to the pandemic and the rise in poverty that I mentioned the decline in event investment and ineffective vaccination efforts where Africa gets less than a percent or perhaps two. Uh, South Africa may have more, but the extent of vaccination has been pathetic. The poorest countries are at the most risk. They need not debt service suspension, but they need debt relief so that they can grow and become uh, able to sustain their debt through debt service payments that they can afford over a longer period of time. And I have a mechanism for doing that. Uh, the mechanism. Thank you, Olga. What? Do you, go ahead. Sorry. The, continue. The, the mechanism is quite simple. Uh, we need to stretch out maturities of debt so the debt de payments are not due today or tomorrow, but over a longer period of time when growth allows the service or uh, servicing of that debt to be more effective and more more manageable. That can be done by cloning the Brady bonds of the 1980s uh, by using what might call. I call Yellen bonds, which uh, issue, uh, which stretch out the debt and guarantee repayment of interest by, by pledging secure AAA rated uh, zero coupon bonds that mature at the maturity of the bonds, the restructured uh, debt, and they allow for stretching out of maturities. There are technical issues there. I can describe them uh, later on. 
Okay, thank you. And Olga, I know you're coming at this from, I guess, sitting in a slightly different place in the in the market. But what do you make of what Mahesh says? How he uh, analyzes the situation and potential solutions, and and I guess especially from your experience, where does sustainable finance and and ESG fit into all of this? Does it have a role to play? Yeah, thank you very much, Courtney. Um, I do agree with the statement of Indira Gandhi, which she said about 40 years ago that po- poverty is the biggest polluter in the world. And that's why it's the first goal of the 17 Sustainable Goals, eradication of the poverty. Um, I would like to talk about the role of financial institution, which can uh, help to mitigate the financial disparity and eradicate poverty, but more from a microeconom- uh, mi- microeconomic point of view, uh, because you had from Mahesh a very uh, thorough macroeconomic uh, outlook. So I would like to talk from the point of view of our financial institution and how do we deal with the, with the, with the problem of po- uh, poverty and financial disparity. Um, we are a regional bank which has a um, sustainable business model at its core because of our shareholders, European Bank of Development and German Development Corporation. And uh, therefore, it's not a modern trend for us. It's a real work which we started doing in 2004. And it includes um, some financial and non-financial functions. So we start with financial literacy. We do believe that population which is educated financially will not go into this huge indebtedness of which Mahesh was talking. But I'm talking now on a micro level, on the level of a household, which are over-debted because of micro, um, micro um, credit organizations, which were charging at um, enormous interest rate, people who cannot calculate the effective interest rate. They were taking opportunity of the people, uh, of their disastrous situation or, or their inability to calculate the rates. And this is not sustainable. This, this is not easy compliant. Therefore, our task as a regional bank is to educate everybody from students to pensioners how to calculate what they're getting on their deposit, how much are they charged on the loan they're taking, and what are their risks, and if they're ready to take these risks. So this is goal number one, financial literacy. Second is lending, but lending at sustainable rates, because um, credit is the motor of the economy, especially now after all these lockdowns and a lot of bankruptcies that we see, especially in the private uh, sector of small medium enterprises. We need to stimulate the economy. We need to uh, increase lending to these small companies. Um, but the rates should be um, acceptable and sustained by their businesses. Again, not to put them further into the problems, into indebtedness, but let them develop and uh, create jobs and hire people and uh, um, actually stand up from their knees. Um, so from, from this, the important point is financing the SME sector. We are great believers that SME is a um, you know, spine of the economy and especially of the emerging economies uh, like Russia, and, and the others in the world, but I live in Russia and I talk from the Russian point of view. So we need to stimulate the sector to grow and we need the jobs to be created in the sector and jobs also for women that I will talk about later. Uh, actually, we have a special loan that we are uh, promoting now more than ever, um, business loans for women, because uh, we think it's important for the women to be Im- employed in the private sector and have their own enterprises because it gives them more flexibility um, for the uh, life-work balance, but also it gives them income. And women are the backbone of most of the families in the emerging markets. So um, when a woman has her own independent income, she can avoid a lot of problems for herself and for her family and for her children. So that's why we think it's really important. These four um, kind of ways of the financial institution that can play in uh, mitigating the financial disparity. Uh, Of course, COVID-19 and the massive lockdowns all over the world uh, has set back um, the goals which should be reached by 2030. There is no way that, that they will be reached. And financial disparity has even widened. So the top 5% of the population has become much richer while they, the rest 
has become poorer. And that's now the task of the uh, supranational organizations, central banks, and financial institutions locally to help people to get out of this difficult, difficult situation. And I completely agree with Mahesh about the debt restructuring, again, on macro level, but also on micro level. That's what we do with our clients. It doesn't help anybody if we will be now charging our clients and taking over the collateral by putting them into the situation which they cannot solve. It's much better for us to extend the term of the loan, to freeze the interest rate, and to let them run their business so that they can pay us back, because that's our initial goal. We want our money back as a bank, but we want economy to be to get healthier. And I think this is a very much ESG approach, because Courtney, you asked me about the ESG approach. It's, it's the mentality and it's the way of thinking when you do business from top to the bottom. So from the management board, where you uh, set the business plan and the goals and the covenants, to the very bottom when the manager talks to the client and explains what ESG products are and what's the difference between ESG loan and green deposit and traditional loan and traditional deposit. How important do you think um, ESG is, though, in all of this? And I wonder, is there... Um, a tension between, you know, the the focus on ESG and therefore the need to meet certain criteria um, versus just the urgency of getting money into people's pockets and food in their mouths. How how can we best balance it? Yeah, of course, ESG. It's um it's not a trend. It's the new way of living. It's a new normal. And uh, those who are not in ESG, I think they will be out of the business very soon. So everybody has to comply with ESG standards. Talking about the taxonomy, yes, it differs. There are so many different taxonomies, which every business can apply to itself or even localize, um, for example, a United Nations taxonomy or European Union or Russian Federation taxonomy. Uh, the most important is the reporting because all the goals and all the... Um, the uh, the tasks of ESG, they should be quantified and should be reported. And that's the most difficult to set up the right metrics because there are no unified metrics yet and they differ within the industries. So basically we are still inventing um, bicycles in our industry. Um, but nonetheless, it's important to, uh, to adapt the metrics which United Nations is proposing in their uh, goals and in 169 tasks that are set out in their declaration and to see which of those metrics and covenants can be applied to your business and then take your national ones. What's important is to show some calculations and quantification. That is not just words. It's not being washing. It's the real business. And um, it's important that your clients and all the st stakeholders around the business are sharing this and seeing this because mm -hmm. this is a good way to, to get the clients, to retain the clients, when you see how the whole community is involved, the whole ecosystem is benefiting from your ESG business model. And this is called stakeholders. So now it's profit with purpose. Of course, companies should be profitable. Otherwise, you can't do e any ESG projects. Uh, you can't do any good if you don't have profit. So we start with Milton Friedman. Yeah, we need to earn profit. But now we add ESG purpose on top of that. And if there is no purpose, then you 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 lose your clients because they will see why they should come to you? Why they should buy your service or product? Was there added value for them or for the environment from, from your job? So it's important to show how all the stakeholders are benefiting from the profit that you are earning. So in our bank, we are showing this on an annual basis. Uh, we, uh, we show the chart where we uh, show the division of our profit to go to our suppliers, our clients, our supervisors, the government, um, our shareholders, our employees, so all the stakeholders involved in our business are getting part of our profit. Thank you. And Mahesh, how much does ESG um, and the concept of sustainable finance feed into your work and what prescriptions you would make for debt reduction in places like Africa? I, I think what, what Olga talks about at the micro level is very important. Uh, <clears throat> ESG uh, is important uh, for uh, 
uh, the reasons that she mentioned, which is you either do ESG today or you're not going to be in the game. Um, the extent of investor interest and commitment to ESG has been illustrated by the recent um, uh, placement on the board of, uh, of a major oil company of activist uh, board members uh, who had very little stake in the company. Um, this is also an opportunity for emerging markets uh, borrowers because they can commit to ESG goals as a condition, for example, to get debt relief um, and and make room for uh, standards uh, that uh, would measure performance. It's something that Carmen Reinhardt uh, at the uh, World Bank is quite keenly interested in. David Malpas is interested in, and uh, 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 I think that one can bring the crisis, as I said, uh, don't ever waste a crisis. Uh, this is uh, a situation where um, the commitment of the investing world and and of the especially the young people to um, to ESG. Uh, can be uh, harnessed to move forward on the problem of debt relief uh, among other frontiers to try to move the development goals forward. So I think it's very important to do the two together. I would say also uh, to Olga's points that what she is talking about in Russia is vital in the emerging markets. Uh, the which is said is uh, more or less that the um, SMEs are the bedrock of uh, an economy. They create the most number of jobs. Uh, jobs have been lost massively, uh, especially for day workers who had to go social distance, uh, distancing and uh, lost their livelihoods. For them to have their livelihoods restored and uh, to have access to credit is quite crucial. And in Africa, this is happening um, in the banking sector with agents uh, banking and the financial inclusion she talked about is also quite crucial to add financial literacy to people who uh, don't understand sophisticated interest calculations and the like. So I think that we have to work on multiple frontiers. Uh, the macroeconomic environment has to be conducive. One of the things that at the macro level that can be done is to foster ESME lending and micro lending through tax incentives. This has been done in many countries quite successfully and can be done to the Again, as a condition of of reform of of, uh, of the debt structure, so I think ESG and and SME lending and uh, financial inclusion can be married. So we can use this crisis to move policy agenda forward in a very effective way. The IMF and uh, Zambia have uh, just uh, uh, agreed on the outlines of uh, uh, what should be done. Uh, uh, for the uh, investors to allow debt relief. Chad has a similar uh, framework agreement, although no private sector debt to speak of. Uh, Ethiopia is uh, uh, not yet quite in place, uh, and other countries will will need more relief, uh, even though economic recovery this year has been stronger than was expected. We are still not going to be at the economic output levels mm-hmm. pre-pandemic for most of the world. Um, so we need debt relief and we need uh, yellow bonds that I spoke about or other structural solutions to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, alleviating the debt burdens and allowing poverty reduction expenditures to take place in emerging markets. Thank, thank you. And we've had a question come in and I would encourage, by the way, our audience just to pop your questions in the chat here on the platform. Um, a question from actually um, a, a, a journalist on my team who specializes in ESG. So I know this was a topic that she would pick up on. And she asked, how has a pandemic impacted on efforts to embrace ESG integration? Uh, maybe, Olga, one for you. Yeah, I think uh, pandemic speeded up ESG integration because everybody realized that we should spe- uh, we should shift to to a new business model, new consumption model, new behavior model, uh, because our life has organically changed and we had more time to to look back and analyze what we are doing and how fast we are we are moving on without thinking twice about the impact of our business and our actions. So um judging by Russia, um 
it's, it accelerated uh, in 2020 significantly on the governmental level and on the corporate level as well. So all of a sudden there were the working groups which were cur uh, curated by the um, central bank and the ministers in different sectors. As I said, the taxonomy, um, Russian Federation taxon taxonomy was uh, elaborated. So we are moving faster and faster towards the um, uh, international standards for ESG, and more and more we understand. I remember that back in 2018, when we still had um, meetings, um, when I was mentioning that we are ESG bank in Russia, everybody asked me to uh, decipher these, these words, these letters. When I was deciphering, nobody could understand what it means anyway. So it, it all looked like, um, I don't know, like a fairy tale. But now it looks like it's the only way to go forward. So the pandemic has changed completely how we understand these three words, um, environmental, social, corporate, governance, uh, compliant businesses, and how we relate to it, which is very important. So it's gone from fairy tale to real life now, we can say. Um, and the if, if there are not any... It's necessity. Mm -hmm. Necessity, yes. Um, unless there are other questions from the audience, and I do encourage you to to pop them in the chat. I, I wanted to ask, we've talked a bit about what financial institutions can do, what we might expect from multilateral institutions. Um, and this is one I'll put to Mahesh first. What are the, the responsibilities or what would you advise at the governmental level? I mean, both from governments that are dealing with heavy debt burdens, but also governments in, in wealthy countries, what what should they be doing to help alleviate this problem? Well, I, I think, uh, again, coming at it from the debt point of view, the Chinese have the most to do, uh, that they can do. The Chinese government uh, has uh, over $700 billion in debt, uh, much of it to Africa uh, from their, uh, I call it Belt and Suspenders Initiative, but it's the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, uh, much of that debt is shrouded in secrecy and in lack of transparency. It's not clear how much it is, to whom it is owed, uh, mm -hmm. from uh, whom it is owed, what it is for, uh, what the terms are, what the collateral is, when it is due to be paid, uh, what are the current terms of interest, etc. So these issues cannot uh, allow for um, debt restructuring. Uh, this lack of transparency... Uh, and the unwillingness of the Chinese to classify their banks as properly as private sector or public sector uh, uh, confuses the ability of, uh, of other lenders to agree to terms that are comparable and fair. So that is going to delay, delay tremendously uh, a reform, uh, uh, the restructuring of debts of countries that are under stress today. That's the most important thing that the governments can do to put pressure from the G20 on the Chinese to come to the table with greater transparency and a willingness to negotiate. Their private sector banks, they so-called 100% state-owned. Those 100% state-owned banks that masquerade as private sector refuse to give debt relief to Zambia as a result of which Zambia went into, into essentially Chapter 11 default. Because the other private sector lenders said if the Chinese who pretend to be private sector but are public sector refuse to play the game, we're not going to play the game either. So mm -hmm. this is the most important thing that, that, the, that, the, uh, that the, the Chinese can do. The second is that the UK is just about uh, is discussing going to 0.5% of the GDP in terms of allocation for development assistance. That's just been shot down by a rebellion in the parliament that may unseat uh, or that may uh, undermine the majority of Boris Johnson. Remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, this kind of uh, commitment is, is, is really reverse of what is required. Um, the amount of uh, uh, governmental intervention through monetary and fiscal policy is in the trillions of dollars, tens of uh, trillions of dollars, that then to cut back on a few billion dollars uh, which are really a pittance compared to the amount that has been spent in monetary and fiscal stimulus, uh, uh, it is it is a travesty. So this is this should be stopped. Yes, yeah. and we've, we've seen even in the U.S. criticizing the U.K. heavily for this decision. Um, we will see 
um, whether that becomes a re reversible policy or not. Olga, sorry, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add about the importance of the go government intervention um, also on the micro level. So in, in Russia, the government has introduced the interest rate holidays, which are still lasting since the beginning of the pandemic. And also they're subsidizing some of the um, crucial industries, the interest rates for agriculture, for example, And we are in the in the agricultural area of Russia, so it's really it makes a big difference to our farmers now when they're when they're um, growing the new uh, crops. So they are coming to to us for the loan with the 50% subsidized interest rate. Makes a huge huge difference, and they do expand and they do employ more people, and we are very very happy to see the growth of this sector. Um, but anyway, we expect more measures from the government to help people to uh, um, to overcome this and to uh, bring their businesses back to a profitable level. Mm -hmm. may, may I add on uh, that, uh, Courtney? I think Olga is right. The debt, the 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 uh, safety net that has been thrown to the uh, uh, the poor although not well targeted, uh, has been extremely helpful. Uh, it is difficult to target and do it fast. So there, is, there are leakages and there are criticisms, but I think it's been very important. It's beginning to lift in the U.S., and that then raises a question of what happens to those who are depending on the relief uh, to uh, go from day to day. Thank you. And another question coming in surrounding the SDGs and do you see opportunities for investments? So, for example, foreign direct investments that could help promote the achievement of SDG one in emerging markets. Is there a role and to what extent could and, and would investors be driven by this target? Uh, yes, of course, we just focus now on that, but equity plays equally important role in promoting the goals and um, uh, er eradicate poverty. So, um, when we discussed this, uh, this webinar, we spoke a lot about the role of venture capital and mm -hmm. their in investment into the impact uh, projects, uh, ESG products. Uh, so, th they, their role is growing and it's really very, very important. Because um, we, sp we spoke about the private sector, it's important to mention the startup sector. So, for example, the young generation, which is called, again, the lost generation. So they were lost in 2002, they were lost in 2008, now they're lost in 2020. There are like three in a row lost generations. It's our future. How can we call them this way? So we need to help them to build the startups. And again, going back to... Um, To, to the role of national institutions, but here we have to provide them with, with capital and with um, debt if it's uh, free of interest rate. So we need to help this uh, growing big sector to stand on their feet. Otherwise, we are tack tackling the poverty problem now, but it will hit us back in five or ten years' time when this lost generation will reach the age of 30 and they will have no income and they will be fully dependable on, on the governments. So this is a tragedy that we should uh, avoid by doing the right measures now from the governmental and private sector level. Uh, yes, I think I that's another... Go ahead. Yes, please. No, go ahead, Courtney. Let you finish, please. No, just to, to add that that is another, I guess, you used the phrase slow-moving train wreck earlier in our discussion about poverty and this uh, sub subsequent row, one after another, of lost generic generations is probably another slow moving train wreck that we need to find a way to avoid yeah, while there, we can. There are several of them, education being another. But yes, I would like to just say that uh, uh, I'm, I've just joined the advisory council of the uh, UN Capital Development Fund and the uh, executive secretary spoke earlier today at the conference. Uh, she has a focus on uh, on what she calls uh, Uh, human development tokens. Uh, this is an mm -hmm. idea uh, following uh, the, the great Swiss's rhino bonds uh, to convert what are externalities for business and investors into, uh, into, into capital market driven uh, investment opportunities 
uh, I've been struck, Olga, you may know Grameen Bank and BRAC, uh, which are very oh. innovative uh, entities that have used social engineering using capital market or business techniques. Um, and I think that if one has capitalism with a human face, which I think is more likely than ever before, given the pandemic, we could actually have an optimistic outlook where if we internalize carbon uh, pricing, if we create human uh, development tokens and if capital markets begin to work, um, as uh, all guys pointed, it will, it will seek to work uh, with massive allocation to ESG uh, friendly and compliant investment outlets, even in, in emerging markets. I think then we could have a, a sea change in what happens down the road. Mm. Yes, human development tokens is a really interesting concept. Um, I want to ask you both, because this is, a, in a way, as I said, a slightly depressing um, topic where we're discussing kind of about the emergencies, about our train wrecks. Um, what level of optimism do you have that, that we can get back on track um, in relation to meeting SDG 1 and increasing the scale? So, Olga, are you optimistic? Yeah, of course. I don't think I have any other chance. I'm, I'm having two children and I want them to live in a beautiful world. Um, I'm optimistic because I think we had a very strong wake-up call and I hope this crisis won't be wasted, as my hair said, never waste a good crisis. So it gives us a lot of opportunities and it reveals a, a lot of problems which should be taken seriously and timely. So... Um, I, I do believe that we probably won't reach the goals by 2030 because only nine years left and we are set back. We didn't come closer to the targets which were set six, almost seven, yeah, six years ago. And actually thinking about the, the whole thing that happened st uh, since Stockholm 1972, we'll be celebrating next year Stockholm plus 50. It's the first time when um, the world addressed the environmental issues. Not much has been done in these 50 years. Uh, in our era of transformations of technology progress, every month we are, we are creating something completely new. And in 50 years, we didn't help the nature to, to become better. So I think it will be a bit slower than, um, in SDG, but because we raised awareness to the level that now we see the change, I think it helps a lot because that's the first thing to raise awareness of every person and of every government. And working together in integration worldwide, I think we can solve this. You know, uh, Courtney, my father used to say that a donkey doesn't move until you twist his tail. <laughs> uh, and uh, we have had our tail twisted last year in a major way. And so we have been shaken to the core worldwide in a co coordinated, synchronized attack on, the, on, our, on us um, from nature. So I think the public worldwide has been sensitized to, to risks of nature like never before. It's not the climate uh, yet, but it's coming. And I think that people can see that. Um, not everybody can see that or is committed to that, but things are changing. So I'm optimistic that the pace of change may pick up uh, if responsible governments show the leadership, if private sector leaders, and I take somebody like Greta Thunberg as, as one, um, if others like that step forward, I think we can see acceleration of change uh, because we are ready for the change. We've been shaken to the core and we are ready for uh, something different and better. Do you think that there is a, enough coordination and enough of a joined up approach from the public and private sectors around all of this? No. No, not at all. Uh, not zero. Uh, I was listening at another panel a couple of uh, months ago to the head of IATA who said the international air travel industry, for instance, is in complete chaos. No coordination between anybody uh, among countries. No, there's, there's chaos. Uh, but but you can see out of chaos that we had in this country, in the U.S., came uh, 
came success. We had the vaccines and uh, that were partly uh, from the investments made under Trump, although I didn't like Trump at all. Second, uh, we have had uh, Biden and now U.S. leads in terms of vaccination. So things can change rapidly if mine, if minds are crystallized and if, if political will is put, put to the task. Uh, so I think we need a major uh, climate disaster before, like my father said, before the, the donkey will move. But we have, this is a, this is already one. So we may need second, which is directly climate related. This was really health related. But if Maldives goes and sinks, uh, or something else, you know, uh, I'm not wishing for that. <laughs> but we need, a, we will see that because it's, it's going to come and then it may be too late, but I'm hoping that it won't be. Because I think the trillions of dollars that all guys talking about, which are sitting there on the sidelines, they will force change. They're looking for this. And the public is, is fed up. The, the young people are fed up. People are, so I think, I think we're going to, we have to assume that humankind has self-preservation instinct and will actually rise to the occasion. <laughs> let's, so let's hope so. Would you like to add? <laughs> Would you like to add to that, Olga, as we have a few minutes left? How do we cut through this, the, the chaos, as, as Mahesh said, and, and really make sure that we drive things forward? Yeah, I think that the cornerstone is um, the education of the population. Because as much as um, uh, there is need for political will and uh, financial uh, solutions and the capital, there must be education of the people. Uh, I see in the emerging countries that the education is lagging behind very much the Western Europe and the willingness to to do the change in their behavior as uh, consumers or th their business models to adjust them to ESG is very, very low because still people are working for the primary purpose of uh, um, profit, but without purpose. And um, in Russia, particularly, I was I was shocked that people do not talk about uh, climate change. They don't know who is Greta Thunberg is. Can you imagine that? That's shocking. And so I think that um, for myself, for example, for my work at the moment, I um, dedicate a lot of time to uh, raising awareness, to education, to delivering lectures, to all levels of population, just to tell them the reality of the. Uh, of the ecological situation, the ESG goals, what are they and, and uh, what shall we do to reach them? Because every global goal should be started with the local household. But if they don't know, if they don't relate themselves with these big global problems, we can't, we can't make a change. As I'm saying, the um, population of Switzerland is 8 million and they can, you know, uh, wash their yogurt cans, but population of uh, India is 1.3 trillion. And if India doesn't do anything, that Switzerland will not help with trying hard. So everybody should work together. But India and Russia with 140 million people polluting like uh, there is no tomorrow. Unfortunately, the low-income countries are the biggest polluters and the major shift should be done there, I think. Yes, and that opens up an, another challenge, which is allowing... Um, developing countries to industrialize as quickly as they need to to create jobs and incomes while not being detrimental to the environment at the same time. It's extremely, uh, extremely challenging. Um, we've come to time, which is a shame because there's more I would like to ask both of you, but I want to thank Mahesh and Olga very much for your time and sharing your expertise and for the work that you do in this very important realm. And I think you're perfectly matched to have this discussion helping us look at things from both the micro and the macro level. So I trust that our audience enjoyed listening to you as much as I did. Um, thank you very much for all of you who have tuned in. Thank you, thank and you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, thank and thank you for the organizers thank for you. giving us this platform. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, thank you everybody, thank, for listening. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Courtney. Bye-bye. And all, and all gone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.